Yeah, you can go ahead. We can start now. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, join and share with you all. I'll just give you a, a, brief, a brief introduction about myself. Um, so I'm an advanced clinical practitioner. Um, my background is um, in orthopedics and trauma um, and spinal injury. I used to work in a spinal injuries unit. Um, and then with working within orthopedics, I gained an interest in orthogeriatrics, um, especially for following through with the fractured neck of femur pathway um, and used to be part of the um, pilot scheme for the NOF audits. Um, and then from there, I became um, a clinical practitioner in frailty. Um, and then I did my fellowship in older person care at King's College London. Um, and now, at the present time, I work three days in the community at Bassett Law preventing hospital admissions. So uh, I will go and respond to care home, nursing homes, um, and patients' own homes. And I have a GP uh, clinic, frailty clinic, uh, once a week uh, for patient reviews uh, that are usually filtered from, from Bassett Law. And for the other two days, I'm now seconded at the moment um, from the frailty assessment units to the um, holistic care team. Um, and I am the uh, delirium uh, lead within that team. So that's just a little bit of background about me. Um, so although delirium can happen at any age, we're in particular today just going to look at delirium in old adults. Um, and for many of you, it would just be a, a refreshment um, of what you know um, already. Um, it is an etiologically non-specific syndrome, um, and it can cause disturbances of consciousness and of attention. Um, perception can change um, and thinking, memory and psychomotor behavior. And, and I'm sure from that, and the emotion, I'm sure from that, you can already see that that could sort of be classified with so many other um, aging uh, frailty complexes um, within people. Um, and even not within the aging, with the consciousness and attention. Um, I suppose now we're seeing people that are um, sort of post-COVID, and one of the symptoms they have of that is sort of a, a foggy head. They're not clearly focused. Um, and so all of those things, although they would give us a, a sort of a red flag that perhaps there's something else going on, could be attributed as well um, to another condition. It's commonly unrecognised. And there was a study in 2019 um, that says a &E doctors miss 87 to 83%. Um, and hospital admissions, uh, we miss 14 to 24%. They do say nurses recognise delirium more frequently than doctors. Um, there's many reasons for that, really, for the, the nurse recognition, and that's because they're with them 24-7, so they can see a change in a patient. Um, A&E doctors missing it, it's because perhaps at times uh, the study would go on to say that they've come into accident emergency with a specific problem, which is the one that we're treating. And you, you don't really know um, the full history of the background of how that patient presents. And also delirium comes in many different forms and they may, may not at the time that they're seen be displaying um, that delirium in a way that you would recognize and trigger it as such. Um, it is a very difficult thing, as I'm sure you'll see as we go further on, for it to be recognised instantly and, and knowing that there's something there. It should always be considered when there's an acute or subacute deterioration in behaviour, cognition or function. Um, and that's easier done when, you know, patients come into any with next of kin and family and you're able to say to them, is this the usual presentation for them? Um, but I'm well aware that there's many residents that are coming from care homes and nursing homes and not always with somebody with them. And even if a carer is with them, don't really know much knowledge of whether this is normal or not for them. And also if they're a patient that already has a diagnosis of dementia, 
um, then again, that impounds on the response that they give. They go on to say that 20 to 40% of delirium cases are preventable. And that's what we're trying to sort of promote uh, within the holistic care team um, that we're looking to see um, how it is that we can improve the care that we give within the ward settings that can turn around or just be aware there's a possibility that delirium could happen. So the course of delirium, usually it's transient and it's a fluctuating intensity. Um, so one minute you could go and assess a patient and they're absolutely fine, not a problem. And then somebody else could go in, say, five, ten minutes after and think what on earth is going on with them. Um, and, and it's very difficult. And I'm sure you've experienced that yourselves. Um, I know I have over time. And I said, well, no, they're absolutely fine. And they're, going, they're looking at me as if to say, well, they're not. <laughs> Most cases can recover within four to six, uh, four weeks or less, but some may take up to six months. Um, and it has been known for some to take longer than the six months. And it may be superimposed on or a progression um, into dementia. It's associated with increased length of hospital stay, functional decline, increased morbidity and mortality, and increased rates of institutionalization. So it is quite a, a big life-changing event um, going through that. And I don't know whether you've ever had opportunity to look on uh, YouTube um, at some of the videos uh, of people that have actually experienced a delirium um, and how it's been um, for them and the difference it's made to them in their lives. So the, these are the types, so there's three types. So the first one is hyperactive and it's most easily recognized. Um, it includes restlessness, uh, agitation, rapid mood changes, hallucinations and refusal to cooperate with others. Um, and to the people that do have the hyperactive delirium, they're the ones that usually we can pick up on because we can't easily ignore the behavior um, that they're displaying at that time. And to them, it's really real. Um, I can recall when I was on orthopedics, a gentleman um, that was in a single room and he'd been a farmer and he came out of the room, we were on nights, screaming that the, the cows were going to drown because the, the floods and all the water coming down the middle of the ward and we couldn't pacify him. And then my colleague said, just go and get some buckets. And I'm like looking after thinking, okay. Um, and so we're there with these bowls in the middle of the corridor as they were scooping out water. But to him, it really calmed him because he, he thought we were helping and it was a real life situation for him. Um, when we followed him through afterwards to um, just see how he was progressing, he could recall that event and he could recall how stupid it was at the time for him to think that um, and yet the reality of it. Um, and the way that we sort of calm the effect. So hallucinations can be real for them. Hypoactive, um, so that can include inactivity, reduced motor activity, sluggishness, abnormal drowsiness. Um, and, and that's the one that's often missed. And uh, you can see that more sort of in a, a ward area. So if you've got somebody that's just sat there and they, they seem to be quite content and they're sleeping, um, they're easy. In a, in a sense um, to miss and to not realize that actually there's something more going on. And then this mix, and these are the ones where I say they, they have the presentation of one minute or one day they may be quite calm. And then next time you see them, they switch um, and they can be quite hyperactive. Um, and that's displayed often with relatives. So you, somebody may have been seeing um, a patient in the morning and thinking, yep, yeah, but everything's going okay, we're getting ready for discharge. And then the family come in the afternoon and um, the sort of patient displays other things that it didn't display when it was reviewed in the morning. And then you get the things from the relatives saying, but he's not right, he's not right. And so it is a very difficult um, diagnosis. So hyperactive, hypoactive and mixed. Symptoms. 
So it's an acute onset, um, and it usually has a, a fluctuating course. Um, it, we do have these signs of inattention, um, disrupted uh, sleep pattern, reduced awareness of what's going on around and what's going on, on to them as, as an individual and as a person, um, and a reduced alertness. That altered consciousness and that change in cognition, hallucination is usually visual, um, fleeting delusions, label effects, rapid shifts in mood and orientation, which can be variably impaired. And going through all of these um, sort of symptoms um, and looking at them again, we could relate them to, to other things. Um, and you could be thinking of perhaps it's an early onset of, of dementia. And I think that's why sometimes in hospital we put a diagnosis of dementia on somebody and actually you would see them again in a year and you'd realise that it was a delirium and not a dementia. Um, and so we just need to be really careful that, that there is a diagnosis there and that we're not labelling um, in that aspect, but there is actually a delirium. Um, Disrupted sleep patterns, all of these um, would have an impact anyway for somebody coming in hospital. I can't think of a, a worse thing than having to share a four-bedded bay with four people that, well, three people, <laughs> unless I shared one of the beds, but with three people that I've never met before uh, in a hard bed with a plastic pillow uh, with a lot of noise going on. So straight away, we would have that sleep pattern um, disrupted. Memory, immediate and recent impairment can just change. Um, and I know when we do the um, four at, you could do that one day. Um, and I, well, I, I've done it within a matter when I did the ortho geriatric part. Um, I can remember reviewing a patient and uh, on the AMT, they got eight out of 10. And when Dr. Atella, who, who I used to work with, came um, only an hour later and he went, Mandy, Mandy, Mandy. And I went, what? And he went, no, 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 it's three. And I'm like, it wasn't, it was eight. And I went back and the change in that person was quite dramatic. Um, and that's really where I learned some of the, the difference that it makes when we do assess and reassess and documenting that down. There are factors that can be identified as predisposing a patient to develop a delirium. Um, this is something that we're wanting to work on, especially in pre-assessment. So if we know any of these triggers, then hopefully we can prevent um, somebody developing. So advanced age, uh, already cognitive impairment, um, severity of a, an underlying illness. I'm sure you've seen people that um, have come into accident emergency and perhaps the family have said to that said to you, I know she's not right because she's acting strangely. And usually when she's like that, she's got a urinary tract infection or a chest infection. Um, and so the family can actually there see a change um, in there. So severity of underlying illness. Depression um, and dehydration, again, really important thing. So we need to really work on the hydration of our patients. Sensory impairment. Um, so often people, when they come into a &E and then onto the wards, if it's been in an emergency situation, may not have their glasses with them, may not have the hearing aids with them. So straight away from the very onset, things are going to be different and change. Functional impairment um, and physical health conditions. So those that have had a stroke or neurological disease, um, chronic renal or hepatic diseases. So to just be mindful um, that there is that risk there. So then there are events that relate to either them coming in or associate treatments that can cause a delirium. So in surgical procedures, there's a really high incidence due to lots of insults upon the body, um, and especially if you're elderly. 
infection, as I've said, with your urinary tract infections um, and also with your chest infections, your cellulitis, um, your, your COVID now. An electrolyte imbalance. So it's important just to, to look um, at the UNEs and LFTs and just seeing everything's okay within that situation. Um, again, if there's been a disruption to the sleep cycle that's been changed, changing medication regimes and multi medications, uh, polypharmacy or medical medication errors. Um, it's really strange in my role. When I was a, an orthopedic practitioner, I used to you sort of have a section of things that you used to prescribe. So I used to prescribe a lot of bone protection. I used to prescribe a lot of analgesia. I used to prescribe a lot of antibiotics. Um, and then when I did the ortho geriatric part, I'd sort of uh, look at some of the medications and, and review them and, you know, sort of make sure the dosage of analgesia was um, sufficient, but not too harmful. And now I spend more time de-prescribing than prescribing. So it sort of goes in a circle. So it's looking at those medications um, that are there that can have effect especially if you've got a patient that comes in um, that shows they've got an acute kidney injury. Um, I'm sure you're aware, you know, it's important just to, to look at the medication they're on, you know, sort of, and suspending those that are harmful that are filtrated through the kidney, just so that it gives chance for repair. Um, and also analgesia as well. Um, you'd be su surprised with some of the analgesia. So we, as part of the holistic care team, we do the falls reviews. So the datexes that have gone in for patients that fall. And as part of that review, I will review the medication that they're on. Um, and only the one that we did yesterday is a 92 year old and they're on 100 of tramadol um, and codeine and some oromorph. And then they're just wondering why. And you sort of think, ooh. <laughs> um, and there may be a very, very valued reason for that. Uh, it may be something, you know, but it, it flags up, it just needs to be reviewed, so to be careful with it. Um, pain as well, patients that, that have pain that, that isn't actually treated, um, then you're more prone to have a delirium. An unfamiliar environment, poor nutrition and hydration and constipation is a real big one. But with all of these, you'll see in a bit, because I've got a, a case study, um, and you will see how they link in with the actual case study um, of what went on. And then we've got our drug and um, alcohol withdrawal. So delirium, it is an acute medical condition. It's pathophysiology, I can never say that word, it's poorly understood. Um, it's likely related to multiple uh, multiple psychological mechanisms that neurotransmission, inflammatory and stress responses. Um, and, and that would show really within if there's a trauma, uh, if there's an infection, um, if there's a stroke, um, then they're the things that can trigger this reaction. Um, and disease or trauma leads to a physical stress response. Uh, if we're younger, we deal with that better. Um, if we're sort of in our 20s, we compensate. I'm sure you're aware we would compensate. So you may have somebody come in with a really severe trauma um, and they, they come in and you think, I don't know how they're coping with that because they're just, you know, and then all of a sudden it hits and they go, they go off. Whereas the older you are, the harder it is to deal with that response. And you never really get back to where you were. It can overwhelm the individual um, due to the neurotransmitters release um, and uptake. So diagnosis really is a, it, it's paramount for us and we have the clinical assessment. Um, so the MMT is the screening tool or the 4AT. Um, so we tend to go now for the 4AT because it, it's easy and simple to use. Um, and it's effective as well. So that would be on the screen. And I'm just working with one of your consultants in A&E, just looking at a, a pathway that we, we can use just to make that sort of um, really easily as we go along. Um, to get an accurate history from someone who knows the patient, again, that is paramount. 
Um, there's been many times and I've spoken to a patient and to me, they've seemed very convincing. Um, I reviewed a lady the other week and um, she told me that she cooked for herself. She still drove um, and she felt sort of quite safe doing that. She did all her own washing. She used to like to, to go down to the cinema. She'd take a dog for a walk. Very, very convincing. Um, and then I rang her daughter. Um, completely different story. So her mum's not driven for 10 years. Um, she doesn't have a dog. The dog died. The daughter does all the washing and meals are delivered. And it's, it's just amazing how people can be so convincing. So getting that collateral history um, is really paramount. Um, and it doesn't matter who gets that. I know, you know, for a lot of the doctors, it's very busy in your department, in your A&E department, but you use the staff around you, um, you know, just to ring the family and just get some history and that they can document that down. Um, you know, like it can be really, really helpful. So this is the four acts tool. Um, so it just looks at alertness. So those patients who are markedly drowsy, difficult to rouse or, or sleepy, uh, those that are agitated and hyperactive, um, and then observe if asleep and attempt to wake, and then ask to state name and address. Um, and then age, date of birth, hospital, place, current year. Ask the patient, please tell me the month of the year, backwards order starting at December. Oh, I've tried doing that <laughs> sometimes myself, and I, it, it's sort of quite can be quite difficult, but there you go. And then acute change or fluctuating course. So all of those are, are scored and the, the score is there. So three plus is a possible delirium, plus or minus cognitive impairment. Um, and then one to three is possible cognitive impairment and naught is delirium and likely. Um, I think that's one of the, the main reasons with the delirium is why we do not diagnose dementia within a hospital setting. Uh, we usually um, it, we ask the GP to uh, refer to memory clinic um, so many months after discharge um, just to rule out that it is a delirium and not a dementia. Then there are assessments that we can do. So the blood tests that are recommended are full blood count, hepatic function test, um, thyroid, B12 and folate, um, always a urinalysis and collection for culture. Um, and then additional tests, um, clinically indicate, if they're clinically indicated, I mean, I wouldn't expect you to do a lumbar puncture <laughs> um, on sort of everybody, but if there's a clinical indication um, that we're doing ECG, chest X-ray, CRP, blood cultures, just to rule out um, the source of infection, if there's any there. Now, this is such a busy slide, um, and it's a comparison of the features of delirium, dementia, and depression. And if you, to go through all that, I'll just leave you a minute to look at it, but there's quite a lot on there and very busyness about it. So I've uh, broken it down on another slide. Do you want to see the other slide? We're still, yeah. So the other slide is just a really sort of simple one for us. So the onset of delirium is abrupt. With dementia, it's usually slow and insidious and depression is variable. We've got to be careful in these present times of this um, abrupt and slow and insidious because you may have um, elderly that come into accident and emergency and when you talk to their relatives they'll say no they're, they're really good, they're, you know that they're, they're independent, they walk, they do all for themselves. One really important question to ask them is when did you last see them? Because especially with COVID, some haven't seen mum or dad for a considerable amount of time. And it may be in that time that they've had that decline and it is actually a dementia um, and it needs following up. Um, the daily course, so with delirium, it's fluctuating. Uh, dementia is usually stable um, and depression is usually stable. Length again with delirium hours to weeks, dementia is variable and, and depression is variable, dementia is years actually. Consciousness uh, with delirium can be reduced. In dementia, it can be clear and in depression, it can be clear. One of the best lectures that I've been to about dementia 
was given by a person that had a diagnosis of early onset dementia. And he was a medical professor um, and he was 54. Uh, he got the diagnosis at 50. Um, he worked for two years after the diagnosis and then has uh, does sort of lectures now um, in regards to dementia. Um, and he, he says that he, he has cues. Now, we didn't know before he gave the lecture that he'd actually got that diagnosis. Um, and it was only sort of through that that he, he told us and said, but he's got cues that helps him to achieve and little markers to tell him where he is. And his wife would give him uh, prompts from the side. So just because there's that diagnosis of dementia, we can still have a very clear conscious and we can still contribute in a very high way. Alertness with delirium can be increased or decreased. Dementia is usually normal and depression is usually normal. Um, activity, again, you can see the difference in the intention and the orientation. So there are similarities, but if you break it all down, there's also some really high markers there. So the management uh, of a delirium is address any infection and more importantly as well, address any pain. It's easy to give pain relief when people are asking for it. If they don't ask, sometimes we don't realize and it, you don't sort of, I don't know why, but the process isn't there sometimes. Ensure adequate hydration and nutrition. Ensure that glasses and hearing aids are accessible or need to be in. Um, it must be really hard when you, your vision is impaired. I know I wear my glasses for reading and now I'd feel lost without them. If somebody asked me to read something, you, you're sort of looking and it's all blurred and it, it's horrible. So for somebody to be in that situation in a strange environment and not being able to see just really enhances um, that experience and it's not a good experience. Um, attention to the environment is essential. Um, quiet area or side room and limit staff changes. Uh, try not to, to move around. Adequate lighting, um, minimal noise. Now, <laughs> that's really difficult, isn't it, in an A&E situation in, in some areas. But um, I know now you, you've got the light source. I hope that you're using that and that's sort of uh, been good for, for the patients to see. Um, gentle repeated reorientation to avoid confrontation, uh, however many times you have to say that. Um, in one of the care homes that I work in, there is a, a, a gentleman that's got a corset cough, and every five minutes he will come and say, can I have a cigarette now, please? Can I have a cigarette now, please? And I start off really calm and say, you can have one in an hour. Can I have a cigarette now, please? You can have one in an hour. And as that goes on and on through the day, you, you can sort of um, imagine, but to him to repeat that and to say, he goes off. Now, if you were to ignore him, then you would have a very different uh, situation and a confrontation. So it's just saying to somebody where you are, why you're there. Try to maintain a normal sleep wake cycle and explain everything. That really is key. Uh, explain the likely cause to the patient, to the relatives and, and to the carers, because it's frightening for them if they see that really big change. Um, an explanation goes a, goes a long way for them. Address anxiety with patients with delirium because they're often really frightened um, and explain the cause of the behavior and of the symptoms in the best way that you can. So identify the underlying cause, manage the symptoms, Prevent injury and delirium complications, and a big one is falls and wondering and harming self or others, um, skin breakdowns and aspiration, and address predisposing and precipitating factors um, in the best way that you can. Management more for when they leave your department onto the wards. Non-pharmacological measures to manage symptoms are so much better. Um, so being a nurse in a single room, um, 
but I know often as and in any we we have to give antipsychotic medication, but always start with a low dose. Um, sedatives and hypnotics can prolong delirium, so we just really need to be aware of that. And a combative and physical dangerous patient may require a more urgent assessment. It's also important that when we do give an antipsychotic that we monitor the patient and we do the patient's observations. And if they won't let us, which is often the case that we document that it has been tried and has been done because we are actually sedating. Um, I don't know whether you all know time and space, do you? This is something that we're trying to get across the trust. Uh, it's the little cards that we have, and it's just remembering the things um, about delirium. It's telling us again that it's a medical emergency. It can be prevented, it can be treated. Um, we need to be aware of the risk factors. We need to suspect it. We need to stop it. Um, and there's the single question squid that we're bringing in, which is, do you think that you or your relative have been more confused lately? And then for the nursing staff, just to be thinking of the things, the time and space would just give a reminder that we need to think of the toilet. Uh, so you have they passed urine, have they not passed urine, have they had a person and bladder scan? Um, I is for infection, is there any sign of infection anywhere at all? M is for medication, look at the medications. Is there something new on the medications? Um, has anything changed recently within the medication? Have they indeed been taking the medication? Um, e is for electrolytes, so looking at the bloods and making sure there's no derangement there. Sort of, you know, the sodium can affect in a very big way. Calcium can affect in a very big way. A, anxiety and depression, any history of that. Nutrition, hydration. D, disorientation is the signs of that. S is for sleep. P, for pain, so looking at how we can manage and control pain. A for alcohol and drugs, so is there any history um, of alcohol use? Um, C, constipation, that's a really big one. Um, and it's one that you know we need to sort of uh, follow through and um, look at because it, again, if the constipated, they're most probably in retention um, and then the electrolytes are gonna be out um, and they're not gonna be eating and they don't really want to drink. So it's a vicious cycle. And then E to look at the environment. So I just want to give you a case study. Um, it's not from our trust. Um, it is a, a, a lady um, that I had contact with. So Mary was 85. Um, she had an unwitnessed fall in her garden and she sustained an injury to her right leg. Um, she was actually out and she was cutting the rose heads off. Um, she loved her garden and she was quite active there. Um, so she was diagnosed with a, an intratocanteric fright, fractured neck of femur. Um, she did have a past medical history of hypertension. There was some mild cognitive impairment. Um, she got heart failure and she did have episodes of depression in the past. So she lives alone. She was independent of all her um, activities of daily living. She was mobile independently. She was a non-smoker, um, social drinker. She used to say she used like a sherry um, at Christmas and rather partial to sherry and trifle. Um, she didn't have any carers, but her daughter, uh, used to take her shopping twice a week. So the medication that she was on was Ramipril 2.5, one at night, and Sertraline 50, one in the morning. Um, she had no known drug allergies at all. So she was taken to the accident and emergency. That's the only picture I could get, so it's not Doncaster Royal Infirmary where she came. But she was seen by a, a, an a &E doctor who requested bloods, uh, ECG, pelvic x-ray, x-ray of right hip and analgesia. 
Follow, Mary following all of her examinations was referred to the orthopaedic team um, and her x-ray confirmed that she had fractured the neck of femur and she spent a total of five hours in the NE department which is pretty good going really isn't it for, for that although we, we try, sort of tried to do so and then she was transferred to the orthopaedic ward. So for those working in A&E that may be the, the end of that story for Mary and they wouldn't know what happened after that and what impact um, any of that had had. Um, let me just show you. So she fell at about 7.30 in the morning. The daughter didn't find her till 9.30. She arrived at A&E at 10.50 and then arrived on the orthopaedic ward at 15.50. She'd not eaten anything at all since her breakfast at seven o'clock that morning. She did have some IV fluids in progress that were commenced in accident and emergency, but she wasn't offered a drink or given a drink because she may have been going on the trauma list. She was really, really tired, so she slept through the tea time on the ward and they didn't wake her. Um, she had been given some oromorph and some paracetamol she couldn't pass urine, so she'd had a urinary catheter inserted. And then she was just told that she'd be going to surgery tomorrow. She didn't really know why she was going for surgery, but she was told that. So she was tired. She was in pain. She was really frightened. She was alone. She'd got an IVI going and she'd got a urinary catheter. She didn't really sleep well overnight and was given some more Oromorph and given more paracetamol. The cannula had tissued sometime during the night, so she'd had no IV fluids, and she was nil by mouth for surgery. She was repositioned by staff, and she'd had her observations taken during the night. By the morning, Mary was more disorientated. She couldn't see a clock, so she didn't know what the time was. Um, she was still really uncomfortable. She was thirsty and she was hungry and she was frightened. She was seen by an anaesthetist and then she was recannulated. IVI fluids were recommenced and she was taken to theatre for surgery. These thoughts are all written down by Mary's daughter at the time um, of how her mum was. On return from theatre, Mary was really disorientated um, she'd gone back to a different bed space. She'd been given more oromorph and paracetamol and she was just really tired and upset and, and didn't know what was going on. So on day one post-op, she was more disorientated. She was showing signs of agitation. She'd not eaten since before surgery. Um, she'd had her, well, she'd removed her own cannula, but she was taking oral fluids and her bloods were taken. So Mary had gone from an independent lady to a lady that needed a supported discharge. She struggled with her mobility following surgery. Um, because of all the confusion and the delirium, um, she'd refused therapy intervention. Um, she showed signs of a cognitive decline and her daughter was really, really upset about that. And one of the things that her daughter kept saying was they kept saying, your mum has got dementia your mum has got dementia and mum had not got dementia. She was discharged to a short-term care in a nursing home because she couldn't go back home. Um, and Mary passed away two weeks after discharge. So all of the things that happened to Mary, when you put them into that context and we see the bigger picture, uh, because you, although we all work in different departments, we work on the whole as a team and it's a journey for the patient. And for you, it's where the second stage of where the journey starts. I suppose it's the ambulance or, you know, the way they get into hospital is, is the first part. And then it's that journey. And so what, what we do um, as a team is to try to make that journey as smooth um, a transition that we can do with the best result that we can give um and look at things in that way so mary had got all these things straight away that perhaps we could have picked up on in a better way so she'd had a fall 
Um, she was elderly. Um, she was in pain. She had had surgery. She was dehydrated. She was hungry. Um, she had a change of environment. So she'd gone in an ambulance. She'd gone into A&E. She'd gone down to X-ray. She'd come back to A&E. She'd gone up to the ward. She'd gone to theatre. She came back to the ward to a different bed space. Um, all much changed. She was constipated um, as well. And she got a urinary catheter. Um, so if there is indication for a urinary catheter, uh, we, we need to try to get that out as soon as we can because it's just something foreign to them in, in the body. Um, NHS uh, England um, did this, uh, are they different today? Detect and manage, I can prevent delirium. Um, and it goes over it again, the things that we've sort of mentioned um, within the things that we need to look at for managing. Um, one of the things we noted um, is that well, so what there's no actually delirium uh, leaflet or anything that you can give to patients or to relatives um, so I've just designed one um, and it's just going it's going out to print and then should be available in the department so it just explains really what it's about um, what we can be prepared for we're then going to adapt that so that it can go to pre-assessments and also to accident and emergency so that it will tell those relatives what to look out for um, during the hospital admission and what the signs are so that hopefully um, we can treat it appropriately sooner rather than later. Um, so there's some delirium resources. Um, there's a delirium project going on. Um, and then there's the patient video, which is really, really interesting. Um, there's one of the videos is of a young lady um, and she had spent um, a lot of time in intensive care unit um, and then had to come back to the hospital for a, um, a checkup. And when she actually entered the hospital, she had a panic attack and she was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, because of the effects that the delirium had actually had upon her. So they're, they're, they're quite strong. Um, so that's it, delirium in old rattles. Do you have any questions at all for me? I think you're all on mute. I think it's a, it's a very good, very comprehensive, simple uh, way of uh, highlighting a problem. Uh -huh. uh, I think I think the, I mean, from your talk and, uh, you know, and we know as well, uh, it's a simple, medicine is a simple, really simple, because in this situation we have seen a, a simple preventable, which is uh, all the things which are in our grasp and we can be, you know, working that practice over over many years in the past. So if we implement these set of things in our practice, so a lot of stuff can be prevented as uh, we have seen from the case study. Uh, you know, I mean, the first of all, uh, you know, we have a fast track system where the, I mean, we used to have in our department, a room where uh, a fraction neck of females used to come in and yeah. we used to do quick sort of tests and then, uh, you know, um, a patient have an accident because clinically most of the time we know it's a broken uh, neck of femur. And from x-ray, people used to go to the orthopedic. We used to call it a femur ward. I don't know what we call it now. So they used to go to femur ward and there people uh, used to be cared for. Because in any day, the problem is, uh, you know, most of the doctors and the nurses are entangled with a lot of patients at, at one time. So it's very difficult, uh, you know, to, to give a proper care. But now it's really frustration because people, I um, mean, I, I know somebody stayed in our department for 20 hours with a fraction neck of femur mm -hmm. quite recently. And I think, I think this is a recipe for disaster really. And, uh, uh, and it, on the delirium aspect, I think, I think because we know that when 
people grow old, their reserve is uh, impaired and reduced. So the normal set of uh, biochemical changes in the body due to stress, trauma, uh, metabolic problems. So the elderly uh, people systems, they can't uh, bear it because they're, they're overwhelmed with it. And that's the way to express because they get confused and delirious and uh, their behavior changes. Uh, so I think, I think we should be mindful of uh, the simple set of intervention and, and causes of delirium, which we could really you know, treat and uh, people can be you know, um, uh, discharged home with minimum stay in the hospital. So I yes. think very, very good presentation. I really liked it because, Thank simple, you. because of its impact and relevance. Yeah, yeah, guys, it's a really, really good presentation. I mean, the time and space, oh, that's a very, very nice mnemonic. I think uh, we could easily remember it and we could prevent it. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Any question, guys? Uh, I've, got a que I've got a contribution to make. Uh, thank you for your good presentation. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, in many times we encounter patients who are going to specialties where probably if you have not worked in those specialties, you probably not have a clue of how a patient management is going to be is going to be done. I did orthopedics myself. So I know that um, if I was call, holding the on call brief for orthopedics, any neck or femur fra uh, fracture that is coming, say, today, from today, say, 9 o'clock when the shift starts until 9 p.m. when we hand over, is not going to make its way to the operating table yeah. because they are working on the list from 24 hours uh, before. So what I always tell my nurses is if they ask me, there's a neck or femur fracture here, should we give a food? Should we? And I say, well, she can eat as much as she wants until 12 midnight, because that is when the, the operating, um, the trauma list will start being revised, because when you hand over at eight o'clock in the trauma meeting, they will say, is this patient being Starved from 12 midnight. So yeah. whilst we're in any, we can we are allowed to feed patients, but that's different from patients going for surgical procedure. Because in general surgery, if you feed a patient who is coming with abdominal pain, you might exacerbate the pain. So it's a little bit different there. So I think we need uh, to educate you know junior doctors. And all the other and our other colleagues to ensure that you know we and, and the nurses as well we speak on the same page about how to look after this patient. Yeah. yeah. To prevent this calamity. You know? Yeah, definitely. I think one one of the things is that um, as part of the fractured neck of femur pathway, that patients need to go to theatre within twenty four hours to receive their best practice tariff. Unless there's a valid reason, as if they're in uh, on uh, warfarin or um, yeah, yeah, such, but, but, but yeah, so the, the but I know the, the yeah. very consistent question that they're asking across all specialties is the patient should have been starved for six yeah, hours. Yeah, they're starved too long, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, I think sort of uh, good practice is when they are reviewed by the orthopedic team um, that they yeah. indicate in A and E. That the you know that there's no space on the trauma list. Um, I, I think it's sort of something, as you say, that needs to be highlighted because they are starved too long, and then often communication um, gets sort of all mixed up, and they'll go to a ward, and and even on the orthopedic ward, then they may think, oh, the fracture neck femur will fast them. Um, so it is an education thing that that needs to come across because um, it makes a really big difference. You know, I know for Mary, from seven o'clock in the morning until you know following surgery, she, it, yeah, it was a poor outcome. And outcomes are poor anyway for elderly patients that fracture the neck of femur. I mean, mortality after a year uh, is yeah. is very very <laughs> low. Um, so yeah, so whatever we can do to prevent is a good thing, um, and to work on that. And in March, we've got the uh, National Delirium Day coming up that we're going to celebrate within the trust, so we're going to try to get a few more of these things sort of, um, of on, on board um, and being around. 
Um, and also just to let you know in a &E that the holistic care team, if you ever need any assistance or any help with any of your patients that come in, um, you can contact us. Um, and we're there, there's the, the full specialist within the team. Um, that is the dementia specialist within the team. Um, there's the delirium. Um, so if you've got somebody that you suspect has got a delirium, uh, we're happy to come alongside you and just give you a little bit of support. Um, even if it means just sitting with somebody for a while to you know, make things easier for you. So uh, the team is around, so do use us. Um, we keep advertising ourselves <laughs> and, and we'll be uh, advertising again in Buzz. But if you need us, uh, we're there to, to work alongside you. I think, I think in any, uh, I don't know whether we have some lead nurse on delirium as well, because um, if, yeah. uh, if we have some sort of role uh, in the nursing staff. So it does really help in uh, patient care. Yeah. And the care standard really improved. Yeah. Because as we have seen the figure, uh, you know, the, the doctors are a bit poor rec recognizer. I think uh, I like the reason because uh, I can uh, see that why the doctors are not uh, in any, you know, mm -hmm. apt to realize the delirium because of the sharp contact with the patient. Yes. I, I've seen patient talking to me under the patient, like absolutely normal sort of conversation. Then in between the conversation, they just uh, deviate from the uh, topic which we're talking about. They yeah. might start talking, as you are saying, about the flood. And I yeah. mean, uh, especially they might say, oh, no, my 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 mom is coming, uh, you know, to pick me up from the school, something like that. Yeah. So, you know, they just deviate from the topic. Then I start suspecting, God, oh, there's something wrong is happening. Yes. Here. Yeah. And I think I think if we have a like a nurse lead into the e e &E, because yeah. what they do they 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 they, they keep on uh, on the the sort of uh, um, guideline and the pamphlet and the advice and these sort of stuff they're very good in that sort of situation. Yes. And the other thing is I think in in in, in a lot of other trust uh, you know the the specialist nurses. And the you know the practitioner uh, like yourself and people like that, so you know uh, they have got quite a bit of frequent visit to the department as well, yes. because when uh, sometimes we have 120, 130 patients in the department and we have a total capacity of 75 uh, into the in the department. So once that capacity is exceeded, so then the people are lost in the system. Uh, I think then the problem arises. So I think if yeah. you have some sort of lead nurse in the a &E, then that, that definitely will, will help. Uh, I think we have a learning disability, some sort of team, uh, team in the a &E at the moment. And yes. They are advertising uh, uh, stuff and, uh, you know, and as the fall now, I think that that's very good campaign. For the, because when, they, <laughs> when I used to see that yellow color initially, I yes. used to say, oh God, what's happening? Yeah, because we 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 in Doncaster, I don't. I mean, if we won't criticize ourselves, we won't improve. We are not good in communication across the board. I don't know why. I yeah. mean, the changes come in any. We don't know what's happening. I think the communication <laughs> need to improve. But that's very very good. You know, the the yellow color and yeah. the socks and the the, the little, uh, you know, the, the the scarf and stuff like that. It's a very very yeah. good good system. Cool, exactly. Yeah, so, good. Yeah, similarly in delirium, I don't know. I mean, we could have some sort of color scheme or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, look into it. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, but I think I think for my colleague Nekka Femer, uh, fast track because I I was working uh, as a junior doctor in NHS when the fast track and the fall national fall, uh, you know, um, the campaign were launched. Uh, uh, yeah, I was registered in uh, in Halifax at the time. Uh, I think I think there are a couple of things. For instance, in our department, uh, still we are not following that set of system. I mean, when yes, a yeah. lady come, a uh, uh, gentleman, elderly gentleman come with uh, suspected neck of femur fracture, I think I would say the first thing, first uh, first uh, thing should be writing some analgesia and putting a bit of fluid up, because these people are normally usually lying on the floor for hours on. And uh, they, they, they have not uh, drank, they are dry, in very really dehydrated. So I think yeah, makeup practice, like sticking a little of fluid up and giving some sort of good painkillers and x-rays, and then the nurses will do ECD and blood test everything. Yeah. 
and then just uh, you know asking our, our orthopedists if they have a bed available. Facial echo block, I think nowadays all the senior doctor can do in any. And uh, you know, so going to a facial echo block and just uh, you know uh, helping people really. So I think I think that's what the medicine is about. It's not a complicated yeah. set of uh, you know uh, science or something. It's, it's medicine is a beautiful uh, specialty. And I think compassion and sensitivity and the caring attitude. Uh, that uh, go a long way in the patient management. Andy, I just wanted to highlight uh, something quickly. Could you go on? Some, um, some yeah. Steps to the slide, the last few slides that you mentioned, it is very important for us to just uh, look back well, and to see what we can do about all those lapses in the AE that we had in the case that you mentioned. Yes. So what, what else we could do? Uh, because that would have been a great addition over there. Because well, once we know it, we would do it. The thing is, it might pass our memory, and then again we do the same mistake again and again. Yeah. And then we recontemplate at this time would be the well, best. You need any help. Okay, so I think when Mary first came in to the end, we look into the. Got me to put the slide up. Uh, the one that you mentioned about the lady with the call. Um, I, what I might do is I might read to your road and see what they want. The note that was taken by the by the daughter. Yeah. Yeah, let's have a look at that again. I don't know. I'll ring up and ask. But you might need to come and pick the lecture up. So that was her time frame. Oh, I, right. I can post it to you. That was where she was really upset. So tired and slept through tea time. I think uh, Patrick has just mentioned because someone coming with a fall would not right away get the surgery until the trauma list is absolutely empty. So it would be a yeah. priority so for the next morning. And it is yeah. always best, if, even if they turn up in the middle of the always night, problem, it is always better at least offer them some fluids, yeah. like yeah. oral fluids rather than, because you may get so IV fluids, so IV hydration, but the fact that how the, well, I, I think it's water changing really in the mouth. The, the fact that see, we overdiagnose them sometimes, uh, we're looking off like, okay, she's severely dehydrated, but we start pushing fluids rather than giving some fluids because the water inside the mouth, the taste of the water and all, it gives us a whole lot of, you know, energy to that patient that, okay, I'm being looked at and I'm, I think I got the, you know, basic need that I need. That is yeah. one thing I, I needed to highlight and has not been, has not eaten since her breakfast. Yeah. For seven hours. I know this is a, the usual case in any, so I'm not, I'm not saying um, something could have been done, but however, now onwards, we need to improve on our um, treatment aspect. It's not the medical treatment, it's a non-pharmacological treatment and fluids and yes. anything um, that you can offer would come under that process. The medication, medication yeah. review part of it, we could highlight it, but there is no way we can change the medication because it will be up to the autogeries to change the medication next day. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, and the I think fact that, that you mentioned a lot of oromorph was given, that, yeah, that that could have been actually uh, stopped uh, by either do a fascia iliac block, as Dr. Junior mentioned, or versus given yeah. the right amount of pain relief rather than just the yeah. oromorph, because oromorph may not yeah. hit the right target sometimes. Yeah, definitely, and and I think for Mary, the oromorph actually um, made it worse, um, and it it wasn't given because she asked; it was uh, it was just given, which. Looking at, at Mary's, because obviously I had to deal with uh, Mary's daughter in quite detail. So the main learning from that for the A&E part um, on regard of um, Mary's daughter uh, was communication. Um, right. Because she was told, uh, and I know it seems, I mean, one of the big things for her, which to us doesn't seem a big issue because I suppose we're used to terminology, uh, but she was told by uh, one doctor that Mary had fractured her neck of femur. And then she was told by another doctor that Mary had broken her neck of femur. And for her, that was a really big thing because she didn't feel that the doctors knew what, what she'd done mm. and, and the classification of it. And I'm like, so I explained to her, um, you know, it's just the terminology that, that we use. 
um, the break, the fracture, you know, that this was sort of an injury. Um, she also said that it would have been helpful to her to know what the process was going to be because um, she didn't realise that mum would be going to surgery. Um, and she wasn't told that by the orthopaedic doctor that came into a &E. When we did the sort of investigation into it, um, the a &E doctor had assumed that the orthopaedic doctor had informed Mary and the daughter that she would go to surgery because she was going to his care. Uh, but he had assumed that the a &E doctor had. So it wasn't until Mary's daughter got a phone call in the evening from the ward when she asked, you know, if they could ring her just to let no mum settled, um, that she was told that mum would be going to theatre the next day. Um, so then she was really worried because she, why now does she need surgery? Because she didn't realise at the beginning. So it's just like you say, the simple things, it's just the, the communication, um, the fact that we know there's no possible way that she, she could get to theatre within that, you know, time slot. So we need to encourage um, food and drink um, and, and just explain in the simple things that to us right. are just part of our everyday life. But for somebody coming into it from a first time situation, um, it, you know, in, into hospital is really frightening. So I think that would have had and made an impact um, on Mary. There is a study in regards to pain relief that um, is quite interesting, really. But it's that if there's a patient that fractures the neck of femur, um, that has also a diagnosis of dementia, they receive less pain relief than those that don't have a diagnosis of dementia. And when I first saw that, I'm sort of thinking, well, um, and but the main learning from that piece of research was the fact that patients that don't have the dementia are able to express better their pain and ask for it, so you, you know, whereas those of the dementia can't always have that expression. So you would give some analgesia, but then you wouldn't think they needed more because they seem settled, yet inside they're not able to express the pain. Um, and that's why we sort of encourage the use of this is me, because for those people that are caring for somebody with dementia, will know the signs uh, of what it is. Um, I've got a gentleman at one of the care homes and I know when he's in pain because he starts rubbing very quickly the back of his hand and it's not his hand that's in pain but you know um, that somewhere he's got some pain and, and it's you know sort of a sign that you get to know um some others they sort of the facial expression um and, and sort of behavior so it it's getting that collateral history so i think as you say i think communication with the family um with the patient um Hopefully the, the leaflet about, you know, the possibility of delirium. Um, people are more prepared if you tell them, you know, if you say this, this, this may happen, it may not. But if it does, it's, it's part of the, you know, sort of process that, we, that can be worked through and, um, and pointing them in that right direction. Um, as you say, hydration, nutrition, um, and, and then just really... Um, communication when we're passing over to other teams um so yeah it's a really good point thank you um to bring out yeah yeah i think i think the other thing is uh, because elderly people okay. present atypically they, there's there's no typical presentation of elderly people so uh, if a christian will be one of the chapters yeah if the commission will be mindful of uh, that sort okay. of concept that they present um, atypically uh, now for instance a little kid comes moment, with the yeah, fracture tibia and uh, if you ask where the pain is, uh, so they will be pointing somewhere else. So I think uh, they present it typically, so that we should be mindful of that. The other uh, was about uh, <clears throat> Suraj, that uh, intravenous fluid and the, 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 the food. I think they complement each other because, uh, you know, a fast track system, if we, if we adhere to that, so I think uh, the instances like uh, uh, you know, Mary will be less and less. Uh, I think the COVID situation has derailed us quite a bit. Though now, you know, the guidelines are a bit relaxed, but uh, in the health services are still there's a bit of problem. Uh, I don't know, I mean, is it a real situation or is it being made up? Uh, for instance, the GP out, they don't see people face to face. 
and uh, in the hospital across the country, uh, you know, the bed weight and the exit block and uh, everything blamed on the COVID. I don't know, I mean, how can we move, move out of this sort of, uh, you know, uh, situation? Uh, because the people are suffering and, uh, you know, so I think uh, the situation is quite frust fr frustrating and uh, uh, really not good, uh, you know, for our patients. So, so it's, 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 I don't know what's happening really. So I think it's better to come out of this COVID situation <laughs> as soon as possible, uh, because we are going to live with this virus like flu. And Omicron is, uh, is a mild virus. And I think, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, what the, the big people in NHS are thinking about that. Yes, it will be good when we're out of the situation. I think the only positive we've seen within the community is that we, we do MDTs for every care home with the oh, GP surgery, so mm -hmm. patients are reviewed, but it, again, it is by teams, but at least they're reviewed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very difficult. And the, the changes that you see in people when you've, you've not seen them is, is quite dramatic. So, so we, are, we are working on a, on a base, bit of side track. We are working on a program uh, in Doncaster and Basla in, in Lausanne with the care of elderly team is Dr. Ash, uh, who's been recently appointed. Uh, you know, we are trying to create a desk in Ailey uh, for that purpose. Uh, and we have also have a <clears throat> program. <clears throat> it's not running fully yet, uh, like a board round, four hourly. And we hope that care of elderly and everybody will you know, join together and identify elderly patients who can be discharged safely to the community. I don't know, I mean, uh, you work in the community that uh, how we could be helping that sort of program. Uh, because I think we are planning to to, to kickstart, you know, it to acquire ASP really. Uh, yeah, I've spoken with Dr. Ash because uh, mm -hmm. I've worked with him on, on frailty and he's telling me about it. It's really exciting, the, the program. I think he's just waiting to get his team yeah, yeah. So, so your that's, your that's way is good. yeah, it it will be ah. really good. The the way it works over at Bassett Law, it, it's a bit sort of. Um, I was in the community first, so although I'm in work for the trust, I'm funded by the CCG uh, mm. to, to work within the care home. So uh, the the way that we've done it there is that um, I do a lot of advanced care planning in care homes for patients not to be admitted. I sort of get to know them, get to know the families, mm. and we realise that, that for some that there's no benefit for them to come to hospital. Um, so we do have more advanced care planning. Um, and then also um, I would review patients within the care home and see if we could actually treat with oral antibiotics or what is it that we would mm. achieve if mm. we bring them in. And also having that opportunity to know the family to say to them, you know, mum may need a, a, a test to see what's going to happen, but then if she has this test are we going to be able to treat it is she going to be able to sort of um, cope with that Do, is that the kind of thing that you want or are we looking for comfort so making those plans um, but then also if they come into a and &E, um, I wouldn't see them in A&E uh, but if they, they went onto the ward and then was um, discharged back to the care home then I would follow through from there and then perhaps mm. see them in the clinic to try to prevent them coming back in. Mm. Um, but what we're wanting within uh, Bassett Law is, is a similar system to, to, to that within the A&E, obviously. Um, but also from May, March, we're setting up um, a frailty pathway network. So we're having a two hour response to patients within the community. Uh, so it's a CCG that have formed a team. So if there's a patient in crisis, they would send the team out within two hours um, and to try to prevent uh, an admission. Um, and then they would be again referred to, to the clinic um, if needed be for follow up. Um, but the, that's that's what they're trying to attain at the minute. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a there's a lot of work going on. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot to be developed. Um, and I think at Bassett Law, it's sort of easier in that with the community because you've got such a big community in Doncaster that it would be very difficult to prevent hospital admissions from in the care homes 
And so being at the front door in A&E and having that turnaround there with, with, with Ash is, is totally the right way to go. And hopefully we'll have a really big impact. Um, and he's so experienced in that. So it may be that it's a you know different pathway for both of the communities because they're very different communities um, and, and very small. I mean, you know, a Bassett Law, you can go into town and you, you will see relatives and people and... and yeah, whereas in Doncaster, it's it, it's quite vast and oh, well, the surrounding well, area is vast as well. So yeah. what works well for us there, I, I think, is a different setup to, to yeah, yeah, uh, the, yeah, the acuity yeah. here, really. Yeah, but it's a really exciting thing that, that um, Ash is doing. Yeah, I know he's spoken to me about it and, uh, yeah, tempted. <laughs> he's, he's doing well. Okay, thank you, Mandy, for like this uh, like yeah. delirium. So thank you. Maybe, like any doctor will we get like benefited from this topic. So yeah. we'll move to another session because we have like tight schedule from like ten to eleven. Okay. So I'll do I go now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we will start another session like by Patrick Musami. Right. Eleven. Okay. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.